So I'm mostly interested in different aspects of iron homeostasis. And today I'm going to present you some recent uh, results from my lab. Uh, the talk will be divided into two parts. One is related to iron, uh, the pathogenic role of iron in the context of liver fibrosis, liver disease. And the second uh, is related to, to uh, the role of some iron regulated proteins in the uh, development of cancer, in the growth of uh, tumors. So let me first give you an introduction on uh, iron, why iron is an important uh, element in uh, biology. Um, well, iron uh, is a part of several proteins uh, and it is essential, it's necessary for many important uh, activities and uh, biochemical functions. First of all, iron is uh, essential for oxygen transport. It's uh, part of uh, hemoglobin within red blood cells, and it actually carries out the transport of oxygen in red blood cells. Iron is also important in the context of oxygen sensing. Uh, there are iron-containing proteins that are thought to be involved in um, the regulation of uh, oxygen sensing via hypoxia uh, inducible factor one. Uh, iron is also essential for several electron transfer reactions that take place in uh, mitochondria during the respiratory chain. And iron is also part of the catalytic center of uh, enzymes like uh, uh, ribonucleotide reductase, which is involved in DNA synthesis, or aconitase, which is an enzyme of the citric acid cycle. Uh, both contain uh, iron within their catalytic uh, site. And iron is mostly found uh, in uh, uh, proteins uh, in two major forms. One is the form of heme, like in hemoglobin, uh, iron is found in the form of heme. And there are several types of iron sulfur clusters with different stoichiometry between iron and sulfur. Uh, and these are very ancient uh, structures that are involved in electron transfer reactions, but also in uh, catalysis. So iron in the context of biology is mostly present either in heme or in iron sulfur clusters. So iron is a very important element from this introduction, but on the other hand, it's also potentially toxic. And this uh, slide illustrates the chemical basis for the toxicity of iron. Ferrous iron, uh, which is uh, this oxidation state of iron, iron plus two, can react to hydrogen peroxide. It undergoes oxidation to the ferric form and uh, at the same time, there is production of hydroxyl radical, and this is the reaction is known as Fenton reaction. Uh, hydroxyl radical is a very toxic uh, molecule uh, or radical intermediate. So ferric iron, the product of this reaction, can react with the superoxide anion and get back reduced to the ferrous form of iron. So basically, if you add up these two reactions, you just need very tiny amount, catalytic amount of iron to have generation of hydroxyl radical from hydrogen peroxide and the superoxide anion, which are natural byproducts of respiration, but are also generated by different enzymes. So in this reaction, you have generation of hydroxyl radical, which, as I mentioned before, is highly invasive. Uh, it has an extremely short half-life, um, but can still attack uh, all cellular macromolecules, uh, promoting oxidation of proteins, peroxidation of lipids, and also mutagenesis uh, when it attacks DNA and RNA. So, uh, so iron is essential, iron is potentially toxic. This suggests that the metabolism of iron has to be very tightly regulated. And this slide gives an overview on the regulation of uh, body iron homeostasis. Uh, basically, we absorb iron from the intestine on a daily basis, about one to two milligrams of iron. And this is a very tiny amount, uh, what we absorb on a daily basis, compared to the total amount of iron in the body, because each of us has four to five grams of iron in the body. And most of the iron is contained within red blood cells uh, in form of heme for the transport of oxygen. Uh, so it's about 70% uh, or more of iron uh, that is involved, uh, it's present within red blood cells or cells implicated in the uh, recycling of uh, red blood cells. So senescent erythrocytes 
undergo phagocytosis by macrophages, and macrophages handle iron from senescent uh, red blood cells, degrade him, liberate iron, and release iron to the circulation, uh, where iron is captured by transferrin. This is a carrier of iron in plasma, and uh, transferrin delivers iron to the bone marrow for a new round of uh, red blood cell uh, synthesis, for a new round of erythropoiesis. So, uh, iron absorbed from the intestine also contributes to the uh, loading of plasma transferrin and delivery of iron to developing erythroblasts. However, uh, quantitatively, iron derived from recycling of uh, senescent red blood cells via macrophages uh, is uh, much more important. So basically, we absorb very little amount of iron to compensate for non-specific losses of iron that occur every day, one to two milligrams per day, uh, through either desquamation or in slot mucosal cells or when we lose uh, blood. Uh, excess of iron in the body is stored in the liver and a few, until a few years ago the liver was considered from the iron perspective just as a storage depot for iron. Uh, as I will discuss in the next few minutes, the liver is much more important uh, in the context of regulation of uh, systemic iron homeostasis. And the liver is important because uh, it secretes a hormone that was discovered less than 10 years ago. The hormone is called hepcidin, hepatic uh, derived, that's where the name uh, comes from. And this hormone controls fluxes of iron from macrophages and from intestinal enterocytes. So remember that these are the two types of cells that release iron into the circulation where iron is captured by transferring and delivered to cells and tissues. So the liver secretes this hormone, which is called hepcidin, and hepcidin, when it accumulates, it blocks the exit of iron from enterocytes. So in this case, it in, in, inhibits the absorption of uh, dietary iron, and at the same time, it blocks the exit of iron from macrophages. On the other side, when hepcidin levels are low, there is unrestricted, unrestricted efflux of iron from these two cell types and uh, there is uh, sufficient iron in uh, plasma transferring. So under physiological conditions, hepcidin is upregulated when uh, body iron stores are high. So when there is no need for import of additional iron, hepcidin blocks the uh, dietary absorption of iron. And the same occurs under inflammatory conditions. So hepcidin is used by a different pathway. Uh, and this is very important for retention of iron within macrophages. And this is something that is known to occur during inflammation. Uh, there is a, a shift of uh, iron from the circulation to uh, reticulendothelial macrophages, which is believed to be uh, favorable for uh, antimicrobial uh, defense mechanisms. So now how does hepcidin uh, operate and what exactly is hepcidin? Hepcidin is a small uh, peptide hormone. It contains just, uh, consists of just 25 amino acids. Eight of them are cysteines. They form four disulfide uh, bridges and one of them is believed to be between two adjust and just in cysteines, which is not very, very common. And uh, hepcidin binds to a protein called ferroportin, and ferroportin is the exporter, the transporter of iron, that is highly expressed in enterocytes and in uh, macrophages. And uh, binding of uh, hepcidin to its receptor ferroportin induces the internalization of ferroportin and degradation in lysosomes. And this is uh, a fusion construct of ferroportin and GFP, the green fluorescent protein. And you can see that uh, this is expressed on the plasma membrane uh, of this, uh, in this cell culture. And the binding of hepcidin results in loss of the signal in the uh, plasma membrane. And you can see this lysosomal um, staining of uh, GFP. So hepcidin is a very important uh, molecule uh, which is involved in many iron-related pathologies and in a way it functions as a rheostat for uh, normal iron homeostasis 
So hepcidin levels have to be within a physiological range uh, in a healthy uh, uh, man and human, uh, man and woman. Uh, when the hepcidin levels increase over uh, the physiological, a physiological threshold, then you have retention of iron within macrophages because the release of iron is restricted. And this is a common condition found in the so-called anemia of chronic disease or anemia of inflammation. So when there is a, a temporary inflammatory condition, there is no problem if some iron is retained within macrophages. However, under chronic inflammatory conditions, this can cause anemia, uh, not because there is a problem in total uh, iron stores, but the problem is that iron is not in the right place. It doesn't go to develop in erythrocytes and it stays within macrophages. And uh, the hallmark of anemia is uh, uh, reduced iron release from uh, macrophage, the hallmark of anemia of chronic disease. At the other end of the spectrum, there are several groups of disease known under the name, common name of chemochromatosis. And this is exactly the opposite phenotype. In chemochromatosis, which is an iron overload disease, there is unrestricted flux of iron from both macrophages and internal enterocytes. And unrestricted flux from enterocytes means that whatever iron we eat, we absorb it. And over the time, uh, absorbed iron accumulates in the body, uh, and especially in the liver, and uh, causes iron overload, which is not uh, uh, a healthy condition. So here we have very, very low levels of hepcidin and a lack of control of the fluxes of iron from macrophages and enterocytes. So a few years ago, uh, people thought that hereditary hemochromatosis is uh, uh, one type of uh, disease and we're trying to find the chemochromatosis gene. So many researchers have searched for the chemochromatosis gene for many years. Now it turns out that there's not just one chemochromatosis gene, there are several of them. And uh, hereditary hemochromatosis is a heterogeneous group of diseases, that, the hallmark of which is accumulation of iron in the body and increased iron absorption. So the so-called hemochromatosis gene was cloned uh, 14 years ago. It's called the HFE gene for hemochromatosis iron. And uh, mutations in HFE are found in the vast majority of patients with uh, hereditary hemochromatosis. Uh, however, it turned out that uh, mutations in some other genes, one of them is called hemojuvelin and the other is transferrin receptor 2, can also cause an iron overload phenotype. And uh, mutations in all of these genes are associated with decreased he hepcidin uh, expression. And mutation also in the hepcidin gene itself can cause iron overload. So we'll mostly focus on this hemojuvelin gene um, because disruption hemojuvelin is associated with an early onset form of chemochromatosis called juvenile chemochromatosis. Uh, so hemojuvelin was discovered in 2004 and uh, uh, on the basis of uh, several patients that have juvenile chemochromatosis, it turned out that they have mutation in hemojuvelin. And two years afterwards, it turned out that hemojuvelin is a BMP core receptor, a core receptor of bone morphogenetic uh, proteins, and uh, is involved in uh, BMP signaling via SMAD proteins. So this is a schematic outline. Hemojuvelin is associated uh, close to the plasma membrane, and when there is a BMP signal, it uh, forms a complex with a BMP receptor and transmits downstream signaling via SMAD proteins, which results in activation of hepcidin mRNA transcription. And this is a more recent model uh, for activation of hepcidin by iron signals, uh, which also places into uh, perspective the other genes of uh, chemochromatosis, HFE gene. So the HFE gene is believed to be bound to transferrin receptor under normal conditions where there is low iron. And uh, this is hemojuvelin and the other players are apart from each other. 
And it's believed that increase in uh, iron levels, increase in saturation of transferrin, results in mobilization of HFE and assembly of a putative iron sensing complex, which uh, uh, contains hemoduvalin, BMP receptor, TFR2, and BMP6. And this is thought to result in downstream signaling. So this is a model based on genetic evidence, uh, which still awaits biochemical uh, corroboration. So now, uh, just finishing this uh, introduction, uh, a common complication of chemochromatosis is uh, liver disease. Because iron accumulates in the liver, excess of iron accumulates in the liver, and uh, uh, many hemochromatosis patients develop uh, liver fibrosis. And uh, fibrosis is a disruption in the balance between the position and removal of uh, extracellular matrix. And uh, a key event is the activation of uh, the hepatic stellate cells into a myofibroblast-like phenotype. Uh, and these activated hepatic stellate cells cross talk with macrophages and uh, release some proembrogenic uh, cytokines, which activate the deposition of uh, collagen and other extracellular matrix proteins. And, uh, Liver fibrosis uh, can progress uh, to different stages uh, and end up into cirrhosis and uh, uh, also hepatocellular cancer. And this is uh, the architecture of the normal liver where these hepatic stellate cells are in a quiescent state. And uh, when there is a stimulus, uh, hepatic stellate cells differentiate into myofibroblast-like cells and uh, they release uh, uh, profibrogenic cytokines, which result in disruption of the liver architecture. So we have been interested, uh, or relatively recently, we developed an interest in mechanisms for, for iron-dependent liver fibrogenesis. And uh, to this end, we employed uh, hemoduvalin knockout mice, uh, which is a model of uh, juvenile chemochromatosis. These are mice that uh, develop iron overload. They were generated soon after hemoduvalin was discovered as a player in systemic iron homeostasis. And this is a staining of uh, iron in the liver. They were generated by two groups. We got these mice from Nancy Andrews' group at Duke University. And uh, we wanted to see how iron overload contributes to the development of liver pathology. Now, I have to stress out that uh, uh, a few years ago, in the 15 years ago, several groups did experiments with iron intoxication of uh, rodents, of rats and mice, and they observed that uh, iron intoxication by itself does not induce liver fibrosis. So basically, uh, they added carbonyl iron to the diet of rodents. This resulted eventually in iron overload, However, in contrast to what is happening in humans, where iron overload predisposes to the development of liver disease, this was not the case in uh, mice. So it was believed that iron overload by itself is not sufficient to cause liver fibrosis in mice. So to this end, we utilized this model of iron overload and uh, we subjected these mice to chemically induced liver fibrogenesis. So there are several chemicals that are known to induce uh, liver fibrosis. And uh, this is uh, the design of our study. Uh, we use these mice as a model of iron overload and uh, wild type mice as controls. And the chemical we use is carbon tetrachloride. So it's known, uh, many researchers use this as a standard approach to create uh, liver fibrosis. So we injected the animal's IP with 10% uh, carbon tetrachloride. And uh, uh, this is a model of liver fibrosis. Uh, it is believed that it resembles several aspects of uh, development of uh, alcoholic uh, liver disease and hepatitis uh, C. Uh, of course, it does not recapitulate all aspects of uh, development of liver disease by this agent, but it's a convenient model. And uh, we divided the mice into four groups. Hemoduvalin knockout mice treated with tetrachloride. This is better shown here. 
uh, or treated with oil, which is the vehicle, and wild-type mice, uh, which underwent the same, exactly the same treatment. And uh, we uh, injected the mice uh, twice a week uh, for up to six weeks, and on week one, two, and four, uh, we sacrificed the mice and uh, we looked, uh, analyzed different uh, parameters. And uh, at the end of six weeks, we sacrificed the final uh, group of animals and we finally analyzed several uh, parameters starting from serum. So we observed that uh, carbon tetrachloride uh, treatment does not significantly uh, affect the saturation of transferrin. So this is a standard iron-related hematological parameter that is measured also if we do a normal blood test. Normally, saturation of transferrin in uh, healthy humans is about 30 to 40 percent, and in mice, it can be up to 50 percent depending on uh, uh, strain. And in hemodrival knockout mice, we also have, we almost have a complete saturation of 100 percent, which is not affected by carbon tetrachloride. Then we look for serum iron levels and for ferritin levels. Ferritin is an iron storage protein and serves as a marker for uh, uh, tissue iron load. So you can observe that in the hemodrival knockout mouse, mice, there is a peak of uh, uh, iron, there is a strong increase of serum iron after two weeks of carbon tetrachloride treatment. The peak is observed at two weeks and then levels uh, go down to almost normal. And this does not happen in wild-type mice. So carbon tetrachloride does not result in release of, uh, or increase of serum iron. And we also noticed that at two weeks, there is a strong increase in serum ferritin levels. And this is a dramatic increase in serum ferritin levels. We recorded values of 60,000 micrograms per deciliter, while the normal range is about 200 to 400. So this is a really very, very high uh, value and the initial value is already high in the iron overloaded uh, mice. And we observe an increase uh, in ferritin in the wild type mice only after six weeks, and this is uh, kind of expected because ferritin is also serum ferritin, an acute phase protein that uh, is increased during inflammation. And here we expect to have uh, strong inflammation after six weeks of tetrachloride treatment. So the increase in uh, serum iron in the absence of changes in transfer and saturation, under conditions where transfer and saturation is full, may suggest that uh, there is unshielded iron in the uh, circulation, not captured by transferrin, which keeps it in an innocuous form, which may promote oxidative stress. So then we look for total transferrin uh, levels. This is TIBC, stands for total iron binding capacity. And we observe that there is a commensurate increase of transferrin or total iron binding capacity levels after two weeks, which indicates that there is no free iron here in the circulation. Iron is rather uh, shielded. So why transferrin uh, gets the expression of transferrin is activated, we don't know, but uh, probably uh, it's a protective uh, mechanism. We then looked for serum transaminases, which are markers for liver function. And we observed that in the iron overloaded mice, after the second week of treatment, where there was an increase in iron and ferritin, there is also a dramatic increase in serum transaminases levels. This is aspartate uh, aminotransferase, and this is alanine aminotransferase. Again, the values here are dramatic, so in the range of uh, 10,000 and uh, 8,000, which are very, very high, while the normal are uh, uh, below uh, 500. And in the wild-type mice, we do see, as expected, an increase in uh, transaminase levels, but it's much later. It's only after six weeks. Uh, while in the hemodrival in the iron overloaded mice, after six weeks, the values go down. They're even lower than in uh, wild-type uh, animals. We then uh, analyzed the livers histologically, and uh, this is a uh, HNE staining to look for liver architecture of wild type mice. And these are the hemodrival knockout mice. We don't see any problem in tissue architecture, 
Uh, however, we noticed some uh, infiltration of uh, lymphocytes in the hemoduval knockout mice, which is not present in the wild type mice. And this is staining for uh, iron with a pearl stain. And you can see, as expected, that hemoduval knockout mice are uh, fully loaded with iron in the liver, while the wild type mice do not have iron deposits. Then we looked for uh, liver architecture after uh, the carbon tetrachloride uh, treatment. And uh, basically, we observed that the iron overloaded mice develop much earlier liver disease. You can see here necroinflammation already one week after the carbon tetrachloride treatment and very strong necroinflammation afterwards throughout the treatment. The development of septal fibrosis after six weeks. While under exactly identical experimental conditions, wild type mice do not develop necroinflammation after the first week, but only uh, after uh, the fourth week of treatment, and after six weeks, they don't make it to develop a septal fibrosis. So there is a kind of delayed response. Uh, we also observed steatosis, and it was indistinguishable between iron overloaded and normal mice. And this is a semi quantitation of the results that I described before, based on some uh, grading uh, methods that are used in uh, clinical hepatology. Uh, Basically, we see much earlier onset of necroinflammatory activity in the iron overloaded mice already after one week of tetrachloride treatment and much uh, earlier and development of fibrosis, which is more severe, the level of fibrosis, the staging of fibrosis, while we don't see significant difference in steatosis. So this is uh, pearls uh, iron staining and uh, we see iron deposits throughout the experiment in the hemoduval in knockout mice. These are iron deposits in the liver in parenchymal cells. Um, we also see some iron deposits in macrophages, while the hallmark of hemochromatosis is iron deposition only in hepatocytes and not in uh, macrophages because there is increased release of iron from macrophages. And urine inflammation, you can see in wild type mice, some iron deposits in these cells, which are macrophages here, and this is also a hallmark of inflammation. So basically, uh, hemoduval knockout mice have iron in uh, hepatocytes, as expected, that is known. Urine tetrachloride treatment, they retain this iron in hepatocytes, but they also stain for macrophages, while uh, the wild type animals uh, accumulate some iron in macrophages as a result of inflammation. Uh, when we quantify iron by the ferrosin assay, we see that carbon tetrachloride does not affect the iron content, uh, uh, neither of hemoduval knockout mice uh, nor of uh, wild type counterparts. We also measured uh, hepcidin levels, and it's known that hemoduval knockout mice express very low levels of uh, this iron regulatory hormone. And then we looked throughout the experimental treatment with carbon tetrachloride, and surprisingly, we found a strong increase of hepcidin expression after two weeks of treatment. So that under these conditions, hemoduval knockout mice that develop iron overload because of uh, lack of hepcidin expression, express much higher levels of hepcidin than wild type uh, counterparts. And most likely this is due to the inflammation because uh, hepcidin is also an acute uh, phase uh, peptide that is induced uh, by IL-6 uh, via the STAT3 pathway. We then looked for expression of uh, profibrogenic uh, uh, molecules uh, following the carbon tetrachloride treatment. And we found that uh, hemoduval knockout mice show a peak of uh, alpha collagen expression after two weeks. Remember, this is a time point where we see increased necroinflammatory activity, increased hepcidin expression, uh, increased uh, serum ferritin, and increased transaminase levels. We also see increased alpha collagen, mRNA, endothelin, uh, and PDGF uh, mRNA expression, which are 
profibrogenic uh, molecules. And we also look for TGF beta, which is the uh, most um, potent profibrogenic molecule. And we see already after one week of tetrachloride treatment a very strong increase in the peak of TGF beta expression. While in wild type animals, all these responses were delayed. And after six weeks of treatment, you can see that wild type animals have much higher levels of all these, or most of these, alpha collagen, endothelin, and PDGF mRNAs of the profibrogenic molecules. And uh, iron overloaded animals, the levels of these, in iron overloaded animals, the levels of these profibrogenic molecules uh, return to almost baseline. So we conclude that carbon tetrachloride treatment triggers an earlier induction of these profibrogenic uh, molecules and cytokines in the iron overloaded hemojuvelin knockout mice. Then we wanted to look for hepatic stellate cell activation. And the marker for hepatic stellate cells is alpha uh, smooth muscle actin, or alpha SMA. And it is known from uh, works of others that uh, carbon tetrachloride treatment induces alpha SMA because it induces liver fibrosis. So this is uh, uh, the effects of carbon tetrachloride in alpha SMA levels in wild type mice. It's a clear potent induction. And when we look for hemojuvelin knockout mice, we observe uh, very high levels after carbon tetrachloride, but we also observe high levels of alpha smooth muscle actin in naive, untreated animals. And we confirmed that with uh, immunohistochemistry. And this is a staining of um, alpha SMA. And we also stained for CD31, which is a marker of endothelial cells. And uh, we observed that there is some uh, alpha SMA staining that co does not uh, co-stain with CD31, which results from uh, uh, activated uh, hepatic stellate cells. So this data clearly suggests that naive hemojuvel knockout mice have a sign of uh, early fibrogenesis, which is the activation of hepatic stellate cells. They contain activated hepatic stellate cells. Moreover, we also found that naive hemojuvel knockout mice have signs of oxidative stress. And uh, for this, we stain the livers with 4-hydroxynonenal uh, antibody, which is a marker of lipid peroxidation. You can see a positive staining in the hemoduvalin knockout livers, and this is a negative staining in the, in the wild type livers. Uh, so this is another indication that uh, there is something going on in uh, naive livers of uh, hemoduvalin knockout mice. And, uh, we further found that uh, naive hemojuvelin knockout mice exhibit high levels of expression or higher than wild type counterparts of alpha collagen, TGF beta, endothelin 1, and PDGF, which are all profibrogenic molecules. So this is without any carbon tetrachloride uh, treatment. So we conclude in this part of the talk that uh, First of all, we showed that hemojuvel knockout mice develop earlier and more severe liver disease after this treatment with a chemical inducer of fibrosis, carbon tetrachloride. And we conclude that parenchymal iron overload triggers accelerated onset of hepatic ne necroinflammation that was documented in the livers and liver fibrosis. And this is a critical difference between our model, our genetic model of iron overload that we have exclusively, at least in the beginning, parenchymal iron overload. This is a difference to the earlier models of iron intoxication from diet with carbonyl iron, where iron is equally distributed between uh, hepatocytes and macrophages. And it is known that the iron content of macrophages can affect um, responses, immune responses of macrophages. We also found uh, in this work that uh, uh, the mechanism of uh, earlier activation of um, uh, profibrogenic mechanisms in iron overloaded mice involves precocious activation of hepatic stellate cells and uh, overexpression of uh, profibrogenic uh, cytokines. And uh, importantly, we also found that a naive 
iron overloaded mice have early signs of uh, fibrogenesis which are not documented in uh, uh, histological alterations in the liver. So we suggest that maybe there is a need of a second hit in these mice uh, to activate uh, a real uh, fibrogenesis that can be documented by uh, collagen deposition and disruption of uh, liver architecture. So now in the last few minutes I'm going to switch uh, gears and present, present you some data uh, linking cellular iron metabolism and uh, cancer. And this is our hypothesis. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, iron is essential for many cellular functions and one of them is cell proliferation. So remember that iron is present within ribonucleotide reductase, the rate limiting step in DNA synthesis. So if cells are depleted of iron, the cells cannot grow. So we hypothesize that disruption of cell iron metabolism may alter growth properties of cancer cells. And this is a brief overview on cellular iron metabolism. In the previous overview, we discussed that iron circulates uh, bound to transferrin uh, once it is released from intestinal enterocytes and macrophages. So how does transferrin iron end up in cells? Uh, this occurs by binding of transferrin to its transferrin receptor, which is expressed uh, in many cell types. Uh, the binding is followed by endocytosis of transferrin, a release of iron following acidification of the endosome, where iron uh, enters a transient iron pool uh, and is used for, uh, uh, utilized f within mitochondria for synthesis of heme or synthesis of iron sulfur clusters, while the excess of iron is stored in ferritin, the major iron storage protein. And what is very crucial for regulation of cellular iron homeostasis is the coordinate regulation of transferrin receptor expression and ferritin expression. And this operates by a mechanism that was uncovered about 15 years ago. It's an elegant uh, homeostatic mechanism by RNA protein interactions, uh, which uh, involves the so-called iron responsive elements. These are simple RNA stem loop structures that are found either in the three prime untranslated region of transferrin receptor mRNA in multiple copies, or as a single copy in the five prime untranslated region of uh, ferritin uh, heavy and light chain. So what happens is that uh, when iron levels are high and there is no need for increased iron import, transferrin receptor mRNA is very unstable and undergoes degradation by N nuclease, while at the same time ferritin mRNA chains can be translated to synthesize ferritin and store excess of iron. However, when iron levels are low and there's a need for increased iron uptake, two proteins called IRPs, iron regulatory proteins, IRP1 and IRP2, bind to cognate IREs and this results in protection of uh, transferrin receptor mRNA from degradation. The binding in the, uh, the RNA protein interaction stabilizes this mRNA while the RNA protein interaction here inhibits translation of ferritin mRNAs by sterically inhibiting access of the uh, small ribosomal subunit, the pre-initiation uh, complex. So basically these IRPs, IRP1 and IRP2, serve as intracellular iron sensors. And a lot of work in the past uh, two decades focused on the mechanism by which uh, IRPs sense intracellular iron and initial work was, was focused on IRP1, which for historical, historical reasons was the first uh, iron regulatory protein to be identified. And this is a very interesting protein because it exists in two states. In iron loaded cells, it assembles uh, an iron sulfur cluster, which keeps it in a very compact form and uh, also renders it to a cytosolic aconitase, it converts into an enzyme, while in iron deficient cells, this cluster gets uh, removed and uh, IRP1 undergoes a conformational change that allow, allows RNA binding. Uh, we also showed a couple of years ago that uh, while this mechanism is uh, uh, reversible and the cluster can be formed in iron loaded cells, when there's a defect in iron sulfur cluster assembly pathways, 
APO IRP1 can undergo ubiquitination and degradation in iron loaded cells. So there's a reserve mechanism for regulating this uh, protein. And uh, this idea originates from IRP2, which is entirely regulated at the level of protein stability. So in iron poor cells, IRP2 is stable and controls uh, IRE containing mRNAs, while in iron loaded and oxygenated cells, IRP2 undergoes uh, degradation by a protein that was recently identified, uh, ubiquitin ligase called FBXL5. And I won't get into details. I will just mention that both IRPs are very homologous and they essentially differ uh, by a stretch of 73 amino acids that is only present in IRP2. This is quite conserved. And initially it was thought that this stretch is involved in the iron dependent degradation of IRP2. Uh, but this is not the case. Now we asked uh, how uh, does overexpression of this IRP1 or IRP2 can affect uh, cell growth and viability? And to address this, we used some cell lines that we have generated uh, for quite different uh, reasons. Uh, so we have used the H1299 uh, human lung cancer cells that are engineered to overexpress either IRP1 or IRP2 by a tetracycline-inducible promoter. So we had these cells in the lab and we asked simply, does the turning on of IRP1 first affect the gro growth properties of these cells? So the answer is clearly no. When we did some MTT assays, we didn't see any uh, profound effects in cell growth. We then grew the cells in uh, uh, agar and uh, we looked for uh, Ancorage independent growth. Again, we didn't find any significant differences, but then we injected these cancer cells into nude mice and uh, nude mice are immunosuppressed when they're injected with uh, uh, cancer cells, they tend to form tumors. They f can form quite big tumors as shown here. Uh, but when IRP1 is uh, turned on by the tetracycle system, we can see that the size of the tumor is significantly reduced and very dramatically reduced. And we have used two different forms of IRP1. This is wild type IRP1. This is a mutant that is always active in RNA binding. So we had a very impressive phenotype in terms of tumor growth. And uh, then at the biochemical level, uh, we found that uh, IRP1 is highly active in the tumor at the end stage of uh, when we sacrifice the animal. This is an RNA binding activity. And uh, we also detect flag tact IRP1 in the tumor. And we found that uh, IRP1 stabilizes transferrin receptor, so increases expression of transferrin receptor as expected. However, quite unexpectedly, it doesn't affect much the expression of ferritin, which is supposed to be suppressed by high levels of IRP1. So for some reason, ferritin uh, repression by IRP1 uh, is uh, bypassed. Then we also look at what happens uh, to IRP2 if we uh, use the cell lines that are overexpressing IRP2. And uh, we used cell lines overexpressing wild type IRP2 or a mutant form, deletion mutant that is lacking this signature of IRP2, the stretch of 73 amino acids. And again, we can express these uh, proteins by removing tetracycline from the medium. And this is a wild type RP2, and this is a deletion mutant that migrates a bit faster. So when we injected these cells into animals, we found exactly the opposite of IRP1. So namely, overexpression of IRP2 enhances the growth of uh, the tumors compared to parent cells. While when we express the mutant lacking the 73 amino acids region, uh, the phenotype was pretty much like in parent cells. And these data are quantified here from three different experiments involving uh, four to five mice at each uh, experiment. So you can clearly see that overexpression of IRP2, wild type IRP2, enhances uh, the growth of uh, tumor xenografts. And the data with the delta 73 amino acid mutant suggests that uh, this occurs via the 73 amino acid domain that. Uh, has not any assigned function so far. So we then ask whether this domain is 
apart from necessary, it's also sufficient to stimulate tumor growth. And uh, to do this, we used uh, two additional deletion mutants of IRP2, lacking the entire uh, C terminus of the molecule. So basically, we generate a dead protein that doesn't have any function, and we don't know how it folds. So it lacks a very big stretch of the C terminus, and we had two different versions. One having the 73 amino acid insert, and another one lacking. And we expected that if uh, the presence of this insert is sufficient, mm -hmm. this uh, deletion mutant should promote tumor growth, while this should not. However, this was not the case, so we had high levels of expression uh, of these proteins in the tumors, but we didn't see any um, uh, significant effect in the growth phenotype. Now, uh, we also showed that uh, the, in the increase, the potentiation of uh, tumor growth by IRP2 was indeed because of IRP2 overexpression and not a clonogenic effect of the clones that we use because we could reverse or at least partially reverse this phenotype by adding uh, tetracycline to the drinking water of the mice. So the addition of tetracycline, you can see here, uh, appears to completely suppress the expression of uh, IRP2 in the tumor. So appears completely in, in this type of assay, which is not highly sensitive. Uh, Everybody knows that there is some leakiness in the tetracycline promoters, and this leakiness might explain why we don't have a complete reversion, but uh, a partial, but very clear reversion of the phenotype. We then looked again for uh, downstream uh, uh, targets of IRPs, uh, as we did for IRP1. First of all, uh, we confirmed that uh, IRP2 is expressed uh, uh, in the tumors when the mice were uh, sacrificed, uh, both wild type as well as the mutant were expressed. We found that uh, wild type IRP2 activates levels of transferrin receptor, pretty much like IRP1. And again, we didn't see any suppressing effects on ferritin expression, which also was surprising but consistent with what we got with IRP1. While the mutant didn't do much on transferrin receptor and didn't do anything on uh, ferritin. So this suggests that uh, the two contrasting phenotypes of IRP1 and IRP2, suppression of tumor growth, potentiation of tumor growth, doesn't have to do anything with two main targets of IRPs, transferrin receptor and uh, ferritin. We also look for some other targets, like ferroportin or DMT1. I won't get into detail. We didn't see any differences in known downstream targets. However, we saw that uh, IRP2 tumors uh, correlated with increased levels of CMYK and also with increased levels for uh, ERK12 phosphorylation. So there is some link between the CMYK pathway and ERK2 phosphorylation. We don't know whether IRP2 directly activates the CMYK pathway or because we have increased tumor growth, CMYK pathway is activated. We want to investigate into uh, this. Uh, but the data so far suggests that uh, there is something going on that is unrelated to the known targets of IRPs uh, that are related to regulation of cellular iron homeostasis. And this view is further confirmed by microarray analysis of tumors from control cells not expressing either IRP1 or IRP2, and from cells expressing, uh, overexpressing IRP1, IRP2, or the mutant of IRP2. Uh, this is a bioinformatics analysis that shows uh, that overexpression of IRP1 and IRP2 activates different sets of uh, genes or correlates with activation of different sets of genes. And uh, there are very few genes that are commonly activated by both IRP1 and IRP2. And there are distinct clusters of genes that are activated by either IRP1 or IRP2. And moreover, uh, analysis, by informatics analysis of this data uh, also confirms or corroborates the view that the deletion of the delta 73 amino acid or the phenotype of the protein with deleted delta 73 amino acid is similar to the phenotype of parent cells not overexpressing IRP2. Uh, this is a so-called principal component analysis. 
So we conclude that IRPs exhibit difference tumorigenic uh, proteins in this uh, system of uh, newt mice. And uh, IRP2 clearly promotes growth of tumors. And uh, we have presented strong evidence that this occurs via its specific 73 amino acids domain that has no assigned function thus far. And uh, we're also confident that this apparent procogenic activity of IRP2 is not related to its function as a regulator of IRE containing mRNAs. And uh, we're actually very interested in looking directly whether IRP2 is a bona fide uh, oncogene, if it's a true oncogene uh, or not. So uh, I would like to acknowledge the people who were involved in this uh, work. The first part, the liver fibrosis part, was uh, almost exclusively done by Giada Sebastiani with the help of uh, Costas Guvatsos and Carmen Mafetone in the lab. And the second part uh, with the mice was done by uh, Carmen Mafetone, uh, postdoc uh, in the lab. Thank you very much.